Well, welcome back. Uh, Pastor Nate and Pastor Grant are here to talk about just uh, another aspect of biblical worship today. And so we've talked about a bunch of stuff, and today we thought we'd get to something that... I, w- I was going to say, this one might be fun because we disagree. <laughs> we don't really disagree on whether or not we should be preaching. <laughs> no, <right. laughs> Wait, who likes preaching? Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. Wait, which one of the pastors is about <laughs> preaching? Uh, but we do it a little differently, so that might be fun. So we just right. thought we'd talk about preaching, sermons, um, and all that kind of stuff. So that's what awesome. we're going to talk about today preaching. So I want to start this one by asking you a question. All right. You are a huge fan yes. of the Prince of Preachers, yes. Charles Spurgeon. Yes. Why? Why do I like yeah, Charles why, Spurgeon? Why do you love him so much? Um, other than the fact that he's one of the <laughs> one of the great preachers that we all look to that's not a Pado baptist I, I do like that <laughs> aspect of him and his beard, of course. Uh, no, I like uh, I like Charles Spurgeon because of his ability. Um, actually, there's a, there's a quote from Charles Spurgeon that I really love. And that is, um, I always am sure to preach with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. And, awesome. and the reason I love that, it's not to say that uh, the newspaper drives yeah. the exegesis of the, of the Word of God, quite the opposite, is that he always teaches what the Bible says and applies it to what's happening in the lives of people. Right. And I found him very, uh, very good in terms of uh, the kind of practical um, aspect of how does this actually change your life? So how does the doctrine of God's sovereignty that I just revealed to you in Scripture mm-hmm. change your day-to-day life, change the way that's you cool. face trials, etc.? So that's why I like him. Beautiful. What about, uh, so I would just say, all right, well, who is one of your favorite <laughs> preachers? Um, I think as far as, you know, sermons that I've read, um, Jonathan Edwards has to be up there. Yeah. And I know he's very famous for a few sermons, namely Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God. But if you read that sermon, it is captivating. Even uh, yeah, if you're not there definitely. Uh, in person, Yeah. Um, we when we were in Brooklyn, we fortunately got to drive up to Connecticut and... There is now a rock where the church was, yeah. where he preached that first in Enfield, Connecticut. That was super cool to be able to see. But that night at the hotel, I remember uh, just pulling up Kindle because you can buy it for 99 cents or something and reading it again. And it only took about 30 something minutes to read the whole sermon. And I was like, man, that really is just amazing. And it's his ability to preach to the heart, yeah. his ability to use uh, natural illustrations. He talks a lot about spiders and webs. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's a lot of natural, uh, you know, stuff in creation that he uses. And, but in order to punch a really, uh, heavy spiritual truth. And then I, I remember thinking he gets tons of flack for being this fire and brimstone, uh, Puritan preacher. But then the whole last 10 minutes of the sermon is just him begging for people to come to yeah. Christ. Yeah. That, God's mercy doesn't, you know, uh, last forever and that Christ is here. You know, the invitation is open. And so it was just an amazing one. John Calvin would be another one who um, I think is a phenomenal preacher. I love his legacy in that he preached every single day for years. And um, I'm going to forget the term now, lectio, but it's basically preaching through books of the Bible. Yeah. Um, it's basically where we get our philosophy for uh, expository preaching. Right. And but. I think there's many examples of the early church that that's exactly what they did. And um, another good one that I've read recently, um, who is a little newer to, to us in history, is John Murray. Mm-hmm. He's a Scottish Presbyterian guy. He taught theology at Westminster yep. Theological Seminary for like 40 years. And... Um, believe it was Banner of Truth or someone put out a book, Oh, Death, Where Is Your Sting? And it's a collection of sermons he preached on various passages from Romans. Yep. They're great. Yeah. They're just really, really good. Yeah. The, his they, lectures on Romans are really good. Yeah. His prayers at yeah. the beginning of when he preached is, is really great. So, yeah. so we, we both have preachers that we're fans of yeah. love. Um, what, my favorite is you're talking about Jonathan Edwards. My favorite sermon mm-hmm. of his is called The Divergent Excellencies of Christ. And he talks about how Christ is both the lion and the lamb, oh, right? Cool. He is he is all powerful and yet humble, right? He's he's unsearchable and yet knowable, and like mm-hmm. all these things that seem so. Uh, basically, his big idea is that um, 
these these things that seem contradictory converge in Christ, which is what makes him so lovely. It's phenomenal. That so good. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have these preachers that we love. Um, in terms of what we think preaching is, okay, so why is, it, why is it that, a, that a, uh, a pastor comes with a prepared uh, talk, mm-hmm. right, on a particular passage of Scripture as opposed to just reading the Scripture? Why is it that the pastor belabors to understand the text and to explain it? Or I mean, it's, that seems obvious, but where are we getting that from in Scripture? So one of the first places I would go to is to Nehemiah. I see you got your Bible open to the New Testament, so we'll get a little of both here. here. We go. Um, but in Nehemiah chapter 8, after the walls are, are finished and they count to, uh, all of the returning exiles, uh, it says in chapter 8 that all the people gathered as one, gathered as one, <laughs> Uh, it, as uh, one man, as one man, into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded to Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, early in the morning until midday. That's a long prayer. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the ear and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Uh, This is great. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for that purpose, right? So they built a a pulpit just for this. And then it's interesting, you skip down and it talks about how um, the elders of the people, it says, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book of the law of God clearly and they gave the sense of it so that the people could understand its reading. And so from there, what you get is like in the midst of the people of God coming back and wanting God to minister to them, Mm -hmm. it's read the word of God and explain it so that they understand it. Um, Earlier in the Old Testament, you see that the priests were given this task to teach the people the law. Yeah. And the priests were interspersed in the whole, uh, you know, land of the promised land, the land of Israel. Yep. And, and that was because that way they could teach the law to all the people. And then uh, right after the time in Nehemiah, that's when the whole synagogue model, I guess, kind of came to be. When the temple uh, eventually, um, well, this is so that people could worship and learn still in their own uh, city or village or that's town right. or whatever. Yeah. The verse um, I had that came to mind is Paul writing in First Timothy to Timothy and encouraging him. And he says in 1 Timothy 4, verse 13, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. So yes, read Scripture publicly, right. but then you exhort with it and you teach with it. Right. And it's Paul too, who um, I can't remember the city in Acts, though he preaches for like hours. And the guy falls out of the, <laughs> the window. Guy, yeah. <laughs> he falls asleep. Yeah, so there's this idea uh, of reading Scripture publicly and just reading it. But then there's a there's a teaching aspect of it, which is one of the offices given in yeah. the church is teacher. That's right. And so and, and you see this in some of the like I'm thinking about Acts seven when um, uh, when Stephen uh, it kind of gives his big long summary. There's yeah. this there's this idea that we we know and internalize the word of God so much that suddenly when there's this moment, you know, Stephen has he can summarize yeah. like the entire story of the yeah. Bible in this in this short summary yeah. and relate it to Christ. And so um, throughout Scripture, we see these men of God who are able to you know take the word of God mm-hmm. and then teach it succinctly or summarize it or or whatever. So um, okay, so there's the command. A couple of questions. Number one, why do we at Crossroads, um, uh, we are committed to what we call expositional preaching, right? Mm-hmm. We, we do, like uh, we were talking about, you open up the, the Bible, you pick a book of the Bible, and right. you start teaching through it. And so right now we're going through Daniel, but um, yep. at various times we just pick a book and go through it, as opposed to, you might there might be other churches that, okay, today, you know, this... This month, we're going to be talking about marriage. And uh, so here are four or five sermons on the topic of marriage, and they'll Mm -hmm. kind of go through and pick out some verses. And that might seem more applicable, but it's not, I don't think either of us would think the model, uh, the best model for for preaching. Why? What tends to happen is that you avoid, or pastors who take this method will avoid hard passages. And that's very common. 
There isn't usually a pastor. I mean, you probably find it somewhere. But typically, the pastor won't go from that sermon series to then a sermon series on hell. Right. Or a, a sermon series on all the wrath passages. Right. Or something like that. Right. Typically, those will kind of get avoided or maybe barely touched on or something like that. And when you go straight through books of the Bible and you dedicate yourself to, you know, we're not going to repeat a book until we've done all of them. Yeah. You know, then it just forces you to have to tackle the hard stuff. And there's a lot of, there's some weird stuff. There's some yeah. hard passages. There's some uh, things that seem contradictory and it just takes some work to, Figure. to understand that it's not. And, and it also um, guards you against uh, hobby horse yeah, um, preaching sure. too. Just you have that one pet doctrine that you love harping on, that you love talking about all the time. And so every year or two, it seems like you come right back to another series, you know, on that like thing, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think that's part yep. of why it's important. I would agree with, I would agree with all that. And, uh, and I think, you know, I've been amazed, uh, pastor, a number of years preaching this way mm -hmm. of seeing how, you know, Number one, if you're preaching with the Word of God in one hand and a newspaper in the other, you're, mm -hmm. you're still always applying it to people's lives because the Bible is our guidebook for life, right? Yeah. And so um, there's always going to be application for us uh, presently. But I've just been amazed at how often um, what's going on in the culture lines up with what's going on in God's Word because God's sovereign over these things, and He actually yeah. can orchestrate these things far better than I can. Um, okay, so now let's get to the fun stuff that we disagree yeah, on. Okay, um, you were just mentioning that. Uh, oh, you went back and read Jonathan Edwards' sermon, yeah. and you read John Murray's sermon, which implies that their sermons are there somewhere in a full transcript. And that's one right. thing that you and I preach differently. Yes. All right. So you transcript. You you yes. you meticulously choose every word. You know, you put a lot of thought into the flow of of uh, the text, and you write out your sermon. So you're just talking to me about a, a sermon that you'll be preaching uh, coming up and exactly how many words it is, right? So you, you do all that. Um, and I go up with much more kind of minimal notes. I have some points that I go through. I mm -hmm. kind of boil it down to a big idea. So that's just a different methodology. So why right. is it that you um, transcript your sermons? Um, well, at this point, um, I transcript just to make sure that something I feel, like I feel the, the weight of responsibility of explaining the scriptures to who's listening. And so if I can transcript, then at least I've prepared and I know um, what I'm, what I'm going to give them, right. what, what's going to be said. And as long as I stick to that, then at least I know maybe a blunder is not going to happen or yeah. just in the moment, something doesn't come out. They're like, Oh, that didn't quite come out right. That might've actually been heresy or something. <laughs> and it's like, if I had it just written out, then I yeah. could have guarded myself against or something like that. And For that's, sure. and I am newer to the art. Um, my, my mentor before coming up here said that he transcript always early on in his ministry. And then he noticed five years in, eight years in, 10 years in, that he could whittle back on a lot of it. Yeah. And it would still be the same thing. He said, you kind of learn your voice, you, your theology gets solidified. And yep. so you kind of just know what to communicate and how to communicate it. And so he said, you know, he probably brings into the pulpit half of what he used to, although it's pretty much still there. And he would say, you don't want to totally do away with it, because you need a safeguard if something happens or whatever <laughs> that you can at least look down and find yourself. But, um, but yeah, that was, that was just what he told me. So I know part of it is at least I'm new to this thing. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I, uh, and, and I, and I agree with all that. I think that's all really good advice. I think, um, one of the preachers we didn't talk about who is actually really influential on me, mostly because of his book, Preachers and Preaching, I was just um, thinking that. Martin Lloyd Jones. And he described preaching as logic on fire, yeah. which I loved, right? Like that's, I think that's such a great phrase is, so you take, you study, right? You internalize the word of God. Mm -hmm. You you understand the passage inside and outside, all of its objections, how people understand it. You come to what you think is is what God's God is trying to communicate through that particular story, that particular text, and then as you're as you're as you're preaching it, that there is a, a, a sort of um, quickening of the Holy Spirit. There's uh, the work of the Holy Spirit where yeah. He takes what you're saying. And so this is another reason why the pastor preaches as opposed to just reading the word of God, because mm -hmm. this is the Holy Spirit actually speaking through the preacher and sort of lighting the logic, lighting the study, writing, uh, lighting the, the prepared notes mm -hmm. on fire. 
And I wouldn't say that that's not possible, like through transcript at all. Right. Like, quite the opposite. The spirit moves <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I actually, and I actually hate the idea that like, oh, if you know, if everything's written out or we plan a worship service, we've he- heard this before. Yeah. If you plan a worship service right down to the letter, then you're putting God in a box. And I was like, and I, my response to that is always. But you put God in more of a box if you think he only works spon- hour. spontaneously <laughs> for that one, <laughs> one hour. hour a week. Yeah, he is actively involved in all of our study and all of our, our prep and all of yeah. our prayer and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what I do find is that, um, for me at least, um, the more eye contact I can keep with the congregation, I think the better. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily because, um, you know, I, I, and so for me, you know, I actually start day one, I write it all out and I mm-hmm. kind of have a sort of a transcript and then I boil it back and yeah. I take out paragraphs and summarize it with a, a few sentences. By the time I go up there, I go up with fairly minimal notes. It's all kind of internalized, but it's not memorized yeah. sort of as a word for word. Now there are times where I'm like, I want to say it just like that. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but the idea is that, um, just in terms of the attention span of people, in mm-hmm. terms of, um, making them feel like what I've prepared, I've prepared for them and not just kind of generically. I've just found that the the more eye contact I make with the people that I'm speaking to, the more personal it feels. And, and I've, I've heard from many people like, why did you look at me when you made that point? Like, I just was looking around. Like I wasn't thinking of you. Like, well, why it was, do you it think? Was, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's sort of it. It's like, well, well, it was. It would cut me to the core, or whatever. And I just find it's yeah. just another avenue where God can use where you look and yeah. and how you you know slow down or you know a sigh and a, a pause and you can do all that with the transcript. But I just found that the more personal you are, the more yeah. avenues there are for a, a, yeah. a sort of connection. Um, with the people that you're preaching to, but uh, but um, it's uh, it's it is interesting when you think back to the the preachers who have stood the test of time, or these preachers that you can go back to, mm-hmm. and they have like we have. Yeah. I have on my shelf. Come and take a look. I got uh, Spurgeon sermons yeah. that he's just because he preached multiple times throughout the week yeah. as well. And you're like, you know, it's amazing that we have those. Yeah. Well, and Calvin, um, I don't think he had a full manuscript, but he hired a I think it'd be called a dick, a dictician. Yeah. Uh, is that the word? <laughs> it is. Dic- yeah. <laughs> dic- 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 I'm thinking of a dictaphone. That's why yeah. I keep laughing. Cause I'm like, what's the uh, word that's not. And he sat and listened to him preached and, you know, wrote it down yeah. and then they edited it later and that became his books and his commentaries and stuff like that. Um, and then Edwards though, no eye contact, <laughs> no literally like the stories yeah. that he read with it in front of his face and not even inflection a ton of inflection. In voice, and, yeah. I think some people disagree, but, um, but definitely not this, uh, charismatic Dynamic, speaker, yeah. like, like others, uh, in America later, like Samuel Davies or, um, who's the other guy, uh, Henry, Patrick Henry, oh, yeah. you know, these guys that could preach and orate and stuff. Um, but Edwards is the one that God used and put that logic on fire and people yeah. are weeping, repenting yeah. of their sin. Coming and to him, trying to get him to pray. And he's just like, keeps reading. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, not, I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, and that's the amazing thing. And I would say that the, the trap you can fall into um, is, you know, there are a lot of people who are really good communicators, mm-hmm. right? Rob Bell is a very good yeah. communicator. Um, but if it's not first and foremost rooted in the word of God, right. right. If people are trying to, and, and we all know the temptation, right. Grant and I are human, uh, with lots of sin. You get up there and you, you've written, whether you've transcripted <laughs> yeah. it or not, you, yeah. you, you say something funny and people start laughing. It's easy to get up there and kind of get distracted. There is a, there is a, a pride that can easily come from having everybody's yeah. attention and being, you know, the guy with the microphone. Right. And, uh, and you definitely need to guard yourself against that. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, church history is littered with people who are good orators, good communicators, uh, and then some who weren't that God just used because their their commitment to the word of God, right. their study, their understanding of God's word was so great that it was still used. And so yeah. the, the reality is, I remember John Calvin once saying um, uh, that God could have sent his angels hmm. to deliver sermons to you, right? But instead he he gave you preachers, flawed men, mm-hmm. and it's for your humility, <laughs> right? It's, <laughs> it's so that yeah. you would know that it's your inferior who's bringing you God's word. And I think that there's something really powerful about understanding what Calvin was meaning by that. So That's awesome. Yeah. So there you go. That's what we think about preaching. That's why we do it the way we do it. That's yeah. 
I guess it wasn't as fun. We didn't argue at all, but uh, that's why we do it a little differently. But uh, we love preaching to you, and uh, we hope that uh, you like listening to us too. So we'll be back next week. Not sure what we're going to talk about next week, but if you have any questions about any of the Biblical Worship series, we look forward to hearing them. Thank you.